Over the past few years, Hyundai has developed a well-deserved reputation for building reliable, value-driven vehicles, but they haven't exactly been known for high fuel economy. Hyundai is hoping to change all of that with a host of new hybrids and plug-in hybrids coming soon, and of course, a dedicated EV and hybrid platform, which is what we're looking at right here, the all-new 2018 Hyundai Ioniq. This particular version is the plug-in hybrid. There is also a pure EV and a regular hybrid available. The regular hybrid is actually the most efficient gasoline-only vehicle in America, delivering up to 58 miles per gallon combined. That's too higher than a Toyota Prius. Now, as I said, we're driving the plug-in hybrid version today. So this trades a little bit of hybrid efficiency. That number goes down to 52 miles per gallon combined in order to give you 29 miles of electric-only range. Obviously, we'll go into the detailed pricing at the end of the video, but I think it's important to keep in mind as we start looking around the Ionic because this is considerably less expensive than many of its direct competitors. This starts at $24,950 for the 2018 model year. That is $8,270 less than a Chevy Volt. It's $9,300 less than a Honda Clarity and even $2,000 less than a Toyota Prius Prime. Now, this vehicle does qualify for a $4,500 federal tax credit, if that credit applies to you, of course. The Volt actually qualifies for a slightly larger credit, which helps shrink that delta a little bit. However, that credit will actually start sunsetting for the Chevy Volt in the third quarter of 2018. And that means that when you're shopping at a dealer later this year, or perhaps in early 2019, the price difference between the Ionic and the Chevy Volt could actually be over $10,000 effectively. Up front, we find standard halogen headlamps and optional HID lamps, which is what we have in the model that we're driving here. The front end looks very much like the regular hybrid model because cooling demands are identical, essentially, between the plug-in hybrid and the regular hybrid. From the side, the Ionic certainly looks like a hybrid vehicle. This overall shape is used by many hybrids and plug-in hybrids like the Prius, the Honda Clarity, and of course the Toyota Prius because it is a very efficient overall shape. Like the Toyota Prius, this is a lift back, so the rear glass actually comes up with what looks like a trunk lid in the back. That helps with the practicality of the Ionic. Like the Prius, you can stick a lot of cargo back there. You'll notice at the bottom of your screen that this is a little bit smaller than many of its competitors, or what I suppose you could call competitors. At 176 inches long, this is 5 inches longer than the closely related Kia Niro, but 7 inches shorter than the Toyota Prius Prime, and a whopping 14 inches shorter than a Honda Clarity. Of course, the Clarity is a mid-size sedan, and in many ways, it's more closely related to the Accord than the Civic, and the Civic would be more this size. So if you wanted to find a direct comparison to this in the Honda family, it would probably be the upcoming Insight. Out back, we have LED tail lamps. You'll notice that the turn signals are red, as you can see over there on the other side, but the backup lamps are actually still incandescent bulbs back here. As we see with some of the other hybrids in the market, we actually have a split rear window. So part of the rear window is right here, and then part of the window is up there. So when you're looking through the rear view mirror, you're looking through both of them, and this spoiler is bisecting your view. Under the Ionix hood, we find a four-cylinder Atkinson cycle engine, but that's where the similarity between this and the Toyota Prius ends. This engine produces 104 horsepower by itself and 109 pound-feet of torque, and it's mated to a six-speed dual-clutch transmission. That's very different than the planetary hybrid setup that we see in the Toyota. This six-speed dual-clutch transmission also contains a 60-horsepower electric motor, basically between the transmission and the engine. That motor can produce up to 125 pound-feet of torque all on its own. That means that when this vehicle is operating as an EV, the power is actually going through that six-speed transmission to the front wheels. So when you're in EV mode, you'll still feel the vehicle shift. The overall design of this plug-in hybrid system is very similar to the regular hybrid Ionic, only the motor is more powerful, 60 horsepower instead of 43, like we see in the regular model. And of course, the battery is bigger and can deliver more power. The battery will give you about 29 miles of electric range, and at that point, this will default to a hybrid vehicle and give you 52 miles per gallon combined. That's six miles per gallon less than the regular hybrid model. These numbers are very, very similar to the Toyota Prius. The Prius will give you two more miles per gallon in terms of its average fuel economy operating as a hybrid, but it will give you less electric range coming in at 25 miles. Versus the Chevy Volt, this will give you 10 more miles per gallon in its hybrid mode, but 24 miles less in terms of electric range. Front seat comfort is quite good in the Ionic. I'm gonna give this nine out of 10 points. Of course, comparisons can be a little bit tricky depending on whether you wanna compare this to things like the Prius Prime, the Volt, or perhaps even the Honda Clarity, 
or whether you want to compare this to your average compact sedan in America. We don't find four-way adjustable lumbar support in this seat, but we do have two-way adjustable lumbar support and a two-position memory over there on the door. We also have a tilt telescopic steering column with a large range of motion. For a compact car, legroom back here is surprisingly generous, and you'll actually find more room back here than you'll find in the Prius Prime or the Chevy Volt, even though this is actually a smaller vehicle overall. It's especially noticeable in the legroom and in the headroom. My head is touching the ceiling, but I still have just a little bit more room back here than we find in many of the competitors. So I still have about two inches of legroom left as well. This front seat was adjusted for a six foot five passenger, kind of in a reverse of what we normally do. And then this front seat over here on the passenger side was adjusted for me. I have about three inches of legroom left. The advantage of the lift back design that we see in many high efficiency vehicles is that it improves cargo practicality because we don't have a separate trunk. We have this large hatchback or crossover like opening, only we get a style that is a little bit more close to the average sedan. Behind this hatch, we find a very impressive 23 cubic feet of cargo space. This is a slight reduction versus the regular model, which comes in at 26 cubic feet. But this is notably larger than a Prius Prime at 19.8 or a Volt, which only has 10.6 cubic feet of storage space. That means you can fit more than double the kind of stuff in this trunk than you can in the Volt. Now, obviously its electric range is a little bit lower, but the trade-off for that is an enormous cargo area. This actually holds even more cargo than the closely related Kia Nero, which is shaped more like a crossover. That vehicle comes in at 19.4 cubic feet. Taking a closer look at the cargo area, we have a roller cover right back there like you'd find in a crossover. Under the load floor, we find a small amount of storage space, but we don't have a spare tire, of course, because the battery is taking up a lot of the room that is further under there. If we lift that completely out of the way, you'll actually see the blower motor that cools the battery and the battery pack itself. As we look around the interior, keep in mind that we are in essentially the top end trim of the plug-in hybrid. You'll find the moonroof right over there above the front passenger's heads. This is a standard moonroof design, not one of the panoramic roofs that we see in some of the competition. The seats in our model feature leather upholstery. The center section is perforated for better breathing, but these seats are not ventilated, they are just heated. Moving over to the front doors, the upper section is a soft touch material, and then we have a soft touch armrest below that. Then we have hard plastics lower on the door as you typically expect in hybrids and other low cost vehicles. Moving from the doors on over to the dashboard, we find more soft touch materials with a soft touch injection molded upper section of the dashboard. We have kind of an interesting pattern going on if we get in a little bit closer, a little bit difficult to tell exactly what's going on, but this is kind of a different texture than we see in the average vehicle out there. Below that, we do find hard plastics on this charcoal section of the dashboard. On the passenger side, we do find a moderately sized glove compartment. I was able to fit a tablet computer inside there. In the center of the dashboard, we have a standard color touchscreen infotainment system that features Apple CarPlay and Android Auto integration. You can see right now, I have the CarPlay screen up. Now, if you get the top end model, then we get factory navigation if you would prefer to navigate with that interface. Below the screen, we have some physical controls for the infotainment system, power and volume over here, enter and tune over there, direct access buttons right there in the middle, and behind this little door, you'll find the SD card for the mapping database. If we continue down the dashboard, we find the dual zone climate control in this model, and as we see in some of Hyundai's other products, we have a driver only button. This helps improve the efficiency of the system overall by limiting the cooling or the heating to just the driver's side of the vehicle. Moving down from that, we find two 12 volt power outlets in this small storage area, USB input, auxiliary input, and a wireless charging mat right under there. Of course, the phone that I'm using does not support wireless charging. Continuing on down from there, we have a pretty traditional console shifter. Sport mode is over to the left. We push away from the driver for up, pull towards the driver for down. On either side of that, we find the heated seat buttons right there, and then a button to switch between EV and hybrid mode. An interesting touch here is that unlike other plug-in hybrids, there is no charge mode. So even if you press and hold this, it won't try and charge the battery with the engine that way. We have two large cup holders moving back from there. You'll notice that this one has more of a square profile, so you can fit sort of juice box shaped things in there a little bit better. And then we have this slot over there on the passenger side. If I move the camera over, you'll be able to see this is more of a tablet computer holder. See, it's quite large, so if I stick my phone in there, there's quite a lot of room. So you could definitely put something like an iPad in there. Moving behind that, we find a moderately sized storage compartment. This is a little on the small side for some front wheel drive vehicles, but it is larger than some. And then inside there, we find a USB charge only port. 
The instrument cluster is quite similar to the other versions of the Ionic. We have a power eco and charge gauge over here on the left side like we find in other hybrids out there. On the right side of the display we find the battery level. So this teal section up here is the plug-in portion and then the white portion is the hybrid portion. So once the plug-in portion has been exhausted you'll be running through this white portion which, which will move up and down based on how you're driving the vehicle. The rest of the display is an LCD element and then we have this physical ring that actually sits right on top of some of the LCD. The LCD is where we find things like our turn-by-turn -turn navigation directions, certain vehicle settings, trip computer information. The display changes based on the mode that we're in. So if we're in our regular drive mode, it looks like this. If we move over to the sport mode, then you'll notice that we get a tachometer there and then a digital speedometer in the center. The steering wheel is somewhat similar to other Hyundai models. We have sport grips up top and interestingly enough, a flat bottom on the steering wheel. Also unexpected on a hybrid, we find paddle shifters on the back of the steering wheel. These actually shift the transmission since this does have a six speed dual clutch transmission. So you'll find down on the left and then up over there on the right. On this side of the wheel, we find the controls for the infotainment system along with dedicated phone buttons right over there. This side we find the controls for the radar adaptive cruise control system as well as for that multifunction instrument cluster. This button changes between the pages. You select the options with this toggle and then click down to OK. Out on the road you'll immediately notice that the Ionic drives differently than a Prius or a Prius Prime. That's of course because the drivetrain is designed very differently. The Prius uses a planetary hybrid system and this uses that six speed dual clutch transmission and a single pancake motor. The result is that this feels more like a traditional vehicle and actually more like a car with a manual transmission and less like the Prius. That means that the Prius is going to feel smoother out on the road, but this is going to feel a little bit more traditional. So if you don't like the way the Prius feels, this may be a good alternative. The reason that Hyundai is using a dual clutch transmission under the hood instead of an automatic transmission is efficiency, obviously. The losses in this transmission are much lower than a traditional automatic transmission. Now on the downside, again, this will feel more like a manual transmission. That means that if you're on certain surfaces, if you uh, put the vehicle in drive and then shift it into reverse and you're still rolling, it will continue to roll like the car is in neutral because it is in neutral. Similarly, if you are climbing a hill and you're doing it very slowly and the car needs to shift gears, the gear engagement can feel a little bit abrupt and it can feel like there's nothing going on in the middle because again, the car has to shift to neutral before it will shift into that gear. So the overall feel is going to be a little bit different. In a way, this is actually gonna feel a little bit more like certain Volkswagen models out on the road because Volkswagen loves to use dual clutch transmissions. On the flip side, of course, the dual clutch transmission improves fuel economy and it also seems to improve performance. Keep in mind, we don't really have a great deal of power under the hood. This model went from zero to 60 in 9.7 seconds, even though it has about the same kind of power that we find under the hood of the Prius Prime. And the Prius Prime took 10.3 seconds to go zero to 60. This is a little bit slower than the regular Prius, but it is actually faster than the Prius plug-in. In our braking tests, this model stopped from 60 miles an hour back to zero and 124 feet, which is pretty good for a hybrid in this segment. This is a little bit shorter than the Kia Niro, which is to be expected because the vehicle is overall a little bit more traditional in shape. Braking is another area where you have to keep the overall design of this hybrid system in mind because the pancake motor is on the engine side of the transmission, not on the side of the transmission where the wheels are located. And that means that as you're slowing down, the transmission is downshifting as it is regenerative braking. So if you're going 70 miles an hour, for instance, you're gonna be in sixth gear, start applying the brakes, it's gonna start recharging the battery. But as you slow down, the transmission is going to have to shift from sixth gear to fifth gear, fourth, third, second, etc., right down to first when you come to a complete stop. And that is going to feel different again than something like a Toyota Prius hybrid. When it comes to our handling score, it sort of depends on what you want to compare the Ionic to. I'm going to give this a B if you're comparing this to other plug-in hybrids and a C if you're going to compare this to your average compact sedan. The plug-in hybrid gets skinnier tires than top end trims of the regular hybrid. So it is important to remember this is not going to handle as well as the regular Ionic. The regular Ionic, especially in top end trims, is actually very impressive when compared against your average compact sedan. We have a more elegant suspension in the back than some of the compact stands in this segment, and it actually road holds better than many of them. But the model that we're driving, again, is the plug-in version, so handling actually drops a decent amount below that regular hybrid. We have extra weight, we have skinnier tires, therefore this is not going to handle as well. 
However, this is going to handle just about as well as the Kia Niro plug-in hybrid and of course the Toyota Prius Prime. The Volt handles a little bit better than the Ionic plug-in, but you do have to give up efficiency in order to get that better handling because the Volt is not going to be as efficient, especially in its hybrid drive mode, as the model that we're driving. It will have a longer range, but it's not as efficient. When it comes to the overall ride score, I'm going to give this model a B. It is fairly firm for a compact sedan that has efficiency in mind, but it's not overly jarring around the corners. When compared to the regular Ionic Hybrid, the suspension does seem a little bit more upset by broken pavement, especially in the corners, but it is still fairly refined. In our cabin noise score, I'm going to give this a split score again, a B if you compare this to other plug-in hybrids, and a C if you're going to compare this to your average compact sedan. Overall cabin noise is well controlled if you were to compare this to a Volt or a uh, Toyota Prius Prime, not as quiet as the Honda Clarity plug-in hybrid but it's also not as quiet as the average compact sedan in America. The difference seems to mainly be in the road noise, especially if you're on a particularly noisy piece of pavement. Wind noise is fairly well controlled, as you would expect out of a hybrid, because of course, coefficient of drag is very important in these vehicles for efficiency overall. So the vehicle's quite slippery in terms of its overall aerodynamics, and that does help with wind noise, but road noise definitely comes into the cabin. That's likely because Hyundai was trying to keep weight to a minimum, so they reduced the amount of overall padding and sound deadening material that we see in the wheel wells in some of the competition. In terms of overall fuel economy, I'm going to give this particular model an A. It actually has been scoring fairly well over a week of mixed driving. We've actually put quite a number of miles on this particular car, almost 900 miles as of the shooting of this video, and we are barely under half a tank of fuel. Obviously, we have been plugging it in whenever possible, mainly at the office, so most of our trips, one way has been primarily in EV mode, the other way has been primarily in hybrid mode. When it comes to overall fuel economy comparisons, if you're doing a lot of city driving, the Prius Prime seems to beat the Ionic in terms of overall efficiency. But the Ionic excels when you're doing a lot of open highway driving. But one thing's for sure, overall efficiency in this model is definitely better than the Chevy Volt. Now again, it's important that you keep in mind that I'm not talking about electric range, I'm talking about overall efficiency. A number of you on our Facebook page were asking if 60 horsepower was really enough for daily driving situations. Keep in mind that this hybrid system is not designed to be an electric car replacement like the Chevy Volt. So the Chevy Volt operates almost identically on electricity as on gasoline. This vehicle does not. Now 60 horsepower is more than enough power for you to go 80 miles an hour on the freeway as long as you're gentle on the throttle. It also is more than enough to get you up and over a 2200 foot mountain pass like I commute on daily. However, if you decide to pass someone on that mountain pass or you want to go up this hill a little bit more aggressively and you put more throttle into it, it is going to have to start the engine. It's also worth noting that in the pursuit of efficiency and most importantly a low sticker price, Hyundai chose not to give us an electric resistive element heater or an electric heat pump in this vehicle. We do have an electric air conditioning system, so this vehicle won't need to turn on the engine in order to air condition the cabin, but on a cold winter morning, it will actually turn on the engine just to heat water in order to heat the cabin. So in that situation, it seems a little peculiar. That's going to be more efficient still than some of the alternatives in this segment, but if you're looking for that pure EV vehicle, this may not be it. In those situations, I would actually recommend just putting the vehicle in hybrid mode and running as a hybrid so you can use the engine to heat the cabin in that situation, and then switch to EV mode later. But again, if you're looking for more of an electric vehicle alternative, this may not be a good choice. You may want to look at the Chevy Volt, because if you live in a very cold climate, this is always going to be using the engine in the winter. The Ionic, of course, comes three ways. We have the electric version, we have the regular hybrid version, and then we have the plug-in hybrid. And in this video, we've been talking mainly about the plug-in model, but it is a little bit difficult to talk about it without also talking about the regular hybrid version. The regular hybrid version starts at $22,200, whereas the plug-in hybrid is a $2,750 jump above that. That's actually a very small premium to pay for the plug-in model, especially when you consider the fact that it qualifies for a $4,500 federal tax credit. Now remember, you should check with your tax professional to make sure that credit applies to you before you depend on it to be able to afford a car. If, however, you qualify for that maximum credit, it actually means that the plug-in hybrid version is going to be less expensive than the regular hybrid version. That's a pretty big deal with the base model, where the cost to operate the two vehicles are about the same, but the plug-in model is going to cost you less and give you access to California's carpool lane. Now, California is changing the way those carpool stickers work, but at the moment, you will still qualify for carpool access for about three years 
if you were to buy the plug-in version of the Ionic or the battery electric model. As you can see, there's a great deal of standard equipment in the plug-in hybrid model, and then one step up from there we have the limited model, so the range is a little bit more tight than what we see in the regular hybrid version of the Ionic. But the price tag really is the key thing here. Again, the Chevy Volt is going to cost you $12,000 more. It will qualify for a larger federal tax credit at this exact moment, but depending on when you buy one, that credit may have actually expired or started to sunset because those credits are expiring over there on the Chevy Volt. The Honda Clarity is just about as expensive, about $11,200 more, and even the Prius Prime is still $5,000 more expensive than the Ionic. It's also worth noting that Hyundai tosses in a lifetime battery warranty on their hybrid and plug-in hybrid models in addition to their 10-year, 100,000-mile powertrain warranty. Now, that warranty is not transferable. It is for the original purchaser only. So if you do buy that Hyundai Ionic plug-in hybrid and then you sell it to someone else, they're not going to get that lifetime battery warranty. But if you buy it and you keep it for 10 or 20 years, theoretically, that battery would be warranted against failure. Now, it's important to note that's not capacity, that's just failure. So the capacity may fade over time, but if the battery stops working entirely, Hyundai says that they will repair or replace it. That's quite different than the battery warranty that we see in our first competitor, the all-new Toyota Prius Prime. Toyota has a pretty typical battery warranty in the industry. It's unusual to have something like we see in the Ionic. Acceleration in the Prius Prime is actually a little bit slower than the Ionic because of the overall weight of the vehicle and the way the two vehicles were designed. On the flip side, the Prius Prime will operate as a true EV under a broader range of circumstances than the Ionic. There is that really limiting feature in the Ionic where you cannot heat the cabin without turning on the engine. So if you live in a colder climate and you want to drive pure EV for a while, then the Prius Prime is going to be a better option for you. Of course, both the Prius Prime and the Ionic are following very similar design philosophies in that they were not designed to operate as an EV across all driving situations. They were really designed to improve efficiency overall and help you offset some of your fuel costs from gasoline to electricity. That's a key thing to remember about the Prius Prime and the Ionic when comparing them against our next competitor, the Chevy Volt. The Volt is faster 0 to 60. It will drive like a true EV. You can opt to never have the gasoline engine on if you so desire, and it has a well-deserved reputation for longevity, but it is over 50% more expensive than the Ionic, and it's not as efficient. That efficiency really is a key differentiator here. Some people will argue this point, and I'm not talking about range. Range is unquestionably longer in the Chevy Volt. However, overall efficiency is not higher in the Volt. Because when the Volt is operating as an electric vehicle, it is less efficient than the Prius Prime or the Ionic plug-in. And when it's operating as a hybrid electric vehicle, its gasoline consumption is higher than the Prius Prime or the Ionic. It's just down to the overall design of the Volt trying to sit right there on the middle of the fence, be a pure EV in some modes and a hybrid electric vehicle in other modes, causes the vehicle to be less efficient overall and definitely way more than the competition. And that's why we see that lower efficiency. But on the other hand, if you want that ability to be a pure EV with the backup plan, the Volt is going to get you closer to that ideal than the Ionic. But keep in mind, the Volt is going to be 50% more expensive than the Ionic, and you have to give up some of that cargo capacity, interior comfort, and I don't think the interior feels 50% more expensive either. There are some areas where it feels perhaps a little bit more premium than the Ionic, but I think overall the Ionic has a more harmonious and more luxurious feeling interior. My bottom line on the Volt is that if you're contemplating a Volt in this category, act fast, definitely buy one before those tax credits run out. Now let's go back to the close cousin of the Ionic, the Kia Niro. I really like the Niro, and this is a bit like comparing sisters one against the other. The Niro's cargo area is smaller than what we see in the Ionic because the vehicle is overall more compact, but I like the more upright seating position that we find in the Niro. I find that just a little bit more comfortable and a little bit more to my tastes. It's probably why people like crossovers a little bit more than sedans these days. But on the flip side, that upright styling makes the Nero less efficient because it's less aerodynamic. And that's why the Ionic is going to give you better MPGs or MPGEs when you're running on electricity. Both vehicles have pros and cons, but when you tally them all together, I think that the plug-in hybrid version of the Ionic comes on top of the plug-in hybrid version of the Nero. I think it's more of a tie when you look at the regular hybrid versions, but on the plug-in side, I actually think the Hyundai wins here.
Now let's talk about a non-hybrid option, like a Hyundai Elantra or any other compact sedan. We made this comparison when we last reviewed the Ionic Hybrid. Like the Ionic Hybrid, the Ionic Plug-in Hybrid should cost you about $600 less a year to operate than an Elantra with an automatic transmission. That is based on 15,000 miles a year, $3 a gallon, and 18 cents per kilowatt hour, which is what a lot of people in California are paying. Obviously, these numbers will change based on where you live in the United States, so the less you pay for electricity, the more the Ionic plug-in hybrid may save you over the regular Ionic. However, in my neck of the woods, the Ionic actually ends up costing about the same to operate on gasoline or electricity, so that's why we save about the same amount one model versus the other. The result is that you'll save about $3,000 over five years just on operating the Ionic plug-in hybrid versus the Elantra. And compared to that other compact Hyundai specifically, the payback time is just under three years. It's right about three years with the regular hybrid model, but because the plug-in hybrid is effectively less expensive than the regular hybrid, the payback time actually ends up being a little bit shorter. And depending on exactly which compact sedan you're talking about in America, for instance, a Honda Civic or a Toyota Corolla that will cost more than an Elantra, that payback time could actually be as little as 12 or 18 months. If you're looking for simply cost-effective transportation, the plug-in hybrid Ionic and the Ionic Hybrid are definitely solid options to consider. The low cost of operation combined with the low cost of acquisition means that the Prius Prime is going to take considerably longer versus the Ionic in order to actually start saving money versus buying a new Hyundai Elantra or another compact stand in this category. It's going to take at least four years longer for that math to start adding up. And of course, if you're talking about a Chevy Volt or a Honda Clarity, that could take you 20 years longer than the Ionic. So again, if you're simply looking for low cost of operation, definitely look at the Ionic. Although the Prius Prime costs more, I actually think that the Prius is worth the extra cash. So when it comes to our overall value calculation, I actually think that the Prius Prime and the Ionic PHEV are on fairly equal footing here. The Prius does cost you a little bit more, but we get slightly better fuel economy in some situations and more predictable fuel economy overall. With everything put together, I found it a little bit tricky to sort things out. I like the Ionic plug-in hybrid, but I think I like the regular Ionic hybrid just a little bit more. However, you will save money with the Ionic plug-in hybrid. So if you're willing to spend a little bit of cash aftermarket, I would probably buy the regular version's wheels, stick them on the plug-in hybrid model, and then you get the best of both worlds. Although again, you will reduce your overall efficiency just a little bit. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comments section below. And of course, you can also take a look at the Toyota Prius Prime because it is a solid option in this segment. Again, I think it matches the Ionic plug-in for value, although it is going to cost you a significant amount more. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already done so down there at the bottom of your screen. Click on up there to Patron if you want to support this channel. And as always, find us over at facebook.com slash alexnautos. I'll see you later.